Dr. Kadan, it's great to see you. Thank you very much for your time. We are going to discuss the main results of 2023. Uh, there is no doubt that the world is standing at a difficult crossroads. Uh, I mean, the sharp rise in the number of uh, conflicts all over the world. Uh, the most severe ones are in Europe and as well as uh, in the Middle East. And as uh, you are, uh, United, European Union top diplomat Josep Borrell admitted that uh, these conflicts could have a very dangerous consequences for EU if it fails to address them properly. But I could, would like to wonder... Um, take into consideration their role of confrontation and their level, don't you think that the belligerents went uh, too far? Uh, yes, uh, we do live in uh, dangerous times and uh, uh, of course uh, there's always the danger that uh, there will be an overreaction and uh, if it comes to uh, wars uh, already uh, Karl of Clausewitz the uh, uh, military theorists uh, uh, of the 19th century, he predicted that uh, any uh, war uh, pushes to the extremes unless there is a peace agreement uh, or a total defeat of the enemy. Uh, so in both cases in Ukraine and uh, Gaza, we don't uh, see a peace agreement in sight. So that means that the war was might uh, continue and uh, there will be even more civilian uh, casualties because if a war pushes to the extremes, it always uh, affects uh, civilians. Uh, but uh, there is a more structural uh, cause uh, beneath uh, these uh, confrontations uh, and uh, we, are we are living in a world of uh, polarization. Uh, all, of course, the world always lived in uh, polarization and whether it's bipolarity, unipolarity or multipolarity, uh, but if there is uh, polarization without uh, effective multilateralism, there is uh, always a danger. And on a global level, uh, we see this polarization between uh, U.S. and uh, China uh, playing out. And of course, in uh, Europe, we see uh, the polarization between the West uh, and uh, Russia. And uh, on a regional level, we see a polarization in uh, in the Middle East. But also we see uh, regional conflict, uh, conflicts uh, elsewhere. So uh, the global picture is uh, somehow... Uh, dire because um, I, there is no real uh, peace uh, uh, resolutions uh, inside when it comes to this big uh, conflict and I don't see a real uh, perspective of global uh, multilateralism uh, multipolarity some say multipolarity is a good sign but multipolarity is was always linked uh, to war uh, just think before the two uh, world wars, we had a multi-polar uh, uh, situation. Um, and uh, it's somehow, uh, a polarization is always linked to ideology building and alliance building, and this is what exacerbates uh, the, the situation. Um, uh, on... on uh, maybe it's a euphemism to speak about uh, multipolarity. What we see is a great power competition. We see some multipolarity beneath this great power competition, uh, US, uh, China, uh, Russia. And there, of course, there are some positive signs. We see some multilateral initiatives like, like the uh, BRICS states. We saw the climate uh, summit uh, in uh, Dubai uh, with partial uh, successes. We see that the uh, uh, UN uh, General Assembly resolutions uh, where the Global South uh, has a voice and uh, the Global South becomes more self-confident uh, now. So uh, we see these two levels of polarization on the global level uh, to some extent also on a regional level, but uh, also uh, uh, some uh, positive signs uh, beneath this uh, 
a global a great power competition. Mm -hmm. We see that several countries offer their peaceful solutions, peaceful initiatives, but it may seem that uh, global players, instead of taking uh, joint efforts to prevent uh, further clashes, uh, they seem to benefit from this escalation and even add uh, fuel to the fire. Don't they care about the consequences? Our consequences uh, are very dangerous. So uh, we do have this... Um, concept of uh, the liquidity trap by Graham Ellison, and he looked at uh, great power competition in the past, and uh, in his 16 cases, he looked at, uh, he, said, um, he found that about 75% of the great power competition uh, would lead to uh, a hot war, a big power war, uh, but one challenger uh, tries to uh, replace the hegemon most of the time. This is uh, the, uh, the the pattern uh, what we see. So uh, of course we again have this great uh, power competition, and the consequences would be uh, terrible. Uh, now, uh, of course, that we do have also nuclear uh, weapons, and uh, if push comes to shove, and as Clausewitz said, if even so during Clausewitz time there were no nuclear weapons, but if it is true what he's saying that the wars always push to the extremes, uh, extreme the ultimate extreme would be also uh, nuclear nuclear weapons. So and the world also is focusing, especially nuclear weapon states, uh, more on and also. Uh, uh, the NATO alliance, uh, de defense and deterrence, and we do, I don't see much of disarmament uh, right now. Of course, there was some positive sign. There was this uh, state party conference uh, in uh, New York just uh, recently, uh, which uh, uh, discussed the treaty and the prohibition of nuclear weapons. At least we have an alternative uh, norm to the uh, deterrence norm, because deterrence has the tendency uh, also uh, to use nuclear weapons in uh, in war fighting. Uh, and uh, so, uh, of course, if you have 70 percent of likelihood of great power uh, competition or great power war, there is a uh, 30, uh, uh, 25, 30 percent um, uh, that, that there are possibility to resolve them uh, peacefully. And of course, we have also concepts from uh, history uh, that shows us that it's possible. Mm -hmm. And what about uh, the neutrality and uh, the new global conflict uh, with Finland's uh, accession to NATO and Sweden's uh, active application? Can we say that non-participation ideas and principles are not actual anymore? I would say they are more actual than ever, because in times of conflict, uh, neutrality and non-alignment uh, are more important uh, than ever. So and, uh, neutrality is always linked to somehow also linked to uh, conflict and uh, a war. If some uh, neutral states, and we see this in history going up and down, uh, neutral states are emerging, disappearing, emerging. Uh, if two neutral states, uh, Sweden and Finland, give up their non-alignment uh, status, we see now the non-alignment uh, emerging in the global south. So it is uh, somehow a continuation of the non-aligned movement, what we have had in the 70s, uh, 80s. Because mo many of the states of, of the global south and east, uh, they don't want to align uh, that much with great powers. Even so, if, as I said, in times of polarization, there is a tendency of alliance building, but there's a counter tendency to stay out of uh, alliances because um, uh, we have this uh, concept in political science. Uh, if you are part of an alliance, there's always the danger of entanglement. Of course, you get the promises to be protected uh, but if push comes to shove and uh, 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 some military conflict starts, uh, smaller states might be entangled uh, in this uh, war as well. And if you look at the NATO um, documents, uh, they also include already not only Russia, uh, but also China in this Article 5 security 
uh, commitment. That means if there is a conflict on the hybrid uh, cyber level uh, and uh, NATO Council decides uh, that is uh, a um, um, uh, military attack and it, uh, on, on, on NATO states, uh, there might be a uh, war which uh, includes most of the NATO members. So neutrality means to stay out uh, of this global uh, competition and uh, to stay out of uh, the potential of a global uh, war. If there is the opinion poll, a service, uh, done by this very transatlantic think tank in Brussels, uh, the European Council on Foreign Relations, done every two years, and they ask European Union citizens if there will be a conflict. They don't even ask uh, military conflict. They say if there is a conflict uh, between uh, China and the US, which side would you take? Uh, of course, not very m many with uh, uh, China, but 60 to 65 percent, percent of the European Union citizens said uh, they want to stay neutral. Uh, so Austria was not included in this survey, but Germany uh, uh, was. So there is this feeling in the world that neutrality matters. Um, and when it comes to Finland and Sweden, I think they had a very convenient status of buffer states. So the Soviet Union, I think, and Russia felt uh, comfortable uh, with, uh, with Finland and Sweden as uh, non-aligned states. I, I, I don't see any NATO or US study uh, saying uh, Russia might attack Finland or Sweden. Of course, there are many studies out that uh, the, uh, Russia is a danger for the Baltic states, which are mem NATO members. So that means there is no real confidence in Article fi fi uh, 5 NATO uh, commitments. Uh, but uh, so that was not really a decision. Of course, the war, war in Ukraine was an incentive to do so, but it was more a domestic decision and the uh, wish to belong to the uh, uh, greater transatlantic uh, NATO alliance, which drove the decision by Sweden and Finland and not so much uh, the Russian threat. But we see, I don't know, I don't know why Finland is really ex exchanging the status of a, a buffer state to a front state now. Of course, now it's a front state and we see already uh, tendencies of rearmament of both sides. Uh, on the uh, Finnish side and on the Russian side to put up, to, uh, put up uh, um, more military equi uh, equipment. Uh, and Finland will be part of forward defense of uh, NATO and uh, Russia will react uh, at the same time. So we will have a new Cold War type of, uh, of, uh, of border between uh, Russia and Finland. So I, I don't think that Finland now is more comfortable uh, than it was before. Mm -hmm. uh, you enrolled uh, in one of your articles that uh, all uh, other wars, usually there are some neutrals, they always breed new ones. Do you observe the emergence of new neutral states in Europe in the foreseeable future? Uh, I, I do think uh, less quantity does not uh, mean less uh, quality. Uh, so if uh, uh, we have less, uh, new, the number of uh, neutral states are going back with uh, Na Finland and uh, Sweden NATO membership, it doesn't mean that the tasks of neutral states uh, will go uh, back as well. So, of course, theoretically, uh, the neutral states remaining in the European Union uh, like uh, Austria and uh, Ireland and uh, maybe also Cyprus, uh, they have new tasks. They can should build a bridge to the global south, and they have the same status than as most of the countries in the global south, non-aligned and non-nuclear weapon states. Uh, I, I, unfortunately, I don't see 
that the policies of these uh, neutral states are really recognizing their more important role. Uh, I don't see that Austria, which would be entitled to play this role, is taking up this role. Uh, so, uh, unfortunately, but in terms of structure, uh, neutrality, I guess, would even become more uh, important. And, uh, of course, I should also mention uh, Switzer Switzerland, which is not a member of the European Union. Uh, but uh, in the past, of course, uh, neutral states uh, disappeared and uh, others came. Let me, but let, let me mention one thing. There is this debate. Uh, if a neutral states, we do have this in Austria, is not protected by an alliance, uh, so uh, uh, neutral states might be in danger to be the target of an uh, uh, of an attack. Uh, I would say I did I did some uh, research with my students and we looked at uh, neutrality and we found out that neutrality as such is a pretty good security guarantee. So uh, there is almost no attack on neutral states uh, if the neutrality is respected and uh, credible. Uh, of course, neutrality has been violated. Uh, we have the case of Belgium in both world wars. Uh, we, we have the cases of Cambodia and Laos in the in Vietnam War. But neutrality is only violated if there is a big war. If there is a big war, the world two world wars or uh, the Vietnam War. Uh, but the primary targets are not neutral states. The primary targets are hostile big sta other states and hostile alliances. So neutral states stand in the way once in a while, but it's asking too much for neutral states to prevent world wars. But other than big uh, wars, in, in big wars, neutrality is, is a pretty good security uh, status. I would like to ask you about another tendency that changes the European political landscape, I mean, the rise of populism. Uh, is it a reflection of uh, disappointment of European population in processes uh, with, with processes that are taking place in their home countries? Uh, populism, uh, you're correct, populism is exploiting deficiencies. So if uh, classical uh, political parties are not addressing uh, the wishes and the feelings uh, of uh, the population, uh, populist uh, states might uh, exploit it and uh, will, will exploit it. Uh, so the classical example is, course, of course, migration. There are much better ways uh, to deal with uh, migration than the traditional parties do. Uh, but then, of course, populists came in and say, "Oh, what we do with all this, 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 this for foreigners um, might be much more intelligent ways to integrate uh, foreigners and uh, to deal with uh, countries uh, where uh, migrants uh, come come from. Not only pay them, uh, like the European Union is trying with uh, Tunisia now to give them money that the." to stop the the the, uh, the migrants so that's not very sophisticated and intelligence uh way to do it uh, uh of course and um there are uh, also uh, when it comes to neutrality and uh, traditional uh, parties to do, do not really use the instrument of neutrality populists came out to come out and say ah we are the real neutrals you you can't really uh, uh, you, you, you're giving up neutrality. So if classical parties, especially in Austria, would not give up the neutrality, uh, the uh, traditional popul uh, the, 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 the populist parties would, could not exploit this. Uh, so uh, in, in, in many ways, a populist party exploiting the deficiencies of traditional uh, parties and uh, I would not necessarily blame the populist parties. I blame the traditional parties that they not really uh, deal with uh, the uh, the issues of uh, uh, of the population, also social issues, for, for example. Of course, uh, so that's uh, yeah, that's that's unfortunate. But I might say it is a possibility not always, that populist parties might turn in 
somehow reliable conservative parties like we see in uh, Italy with uh, Meloni. So she's more becoming more and more traditional leader of a traditional party. So and now, of course, other populists are taking over like uh, Salvini. In, uh, that's that's always uh, uh, the case. Um, yeah, but but that's uh, a danger that uh, Europeans have to deal with. But also, you see this in the United States. That's uh, especially when it we will see it in the coming election campaign uh, when uh, Trump, former President uh, Donald Trump, will exploit the migration issue again. So thank you very much, Dr. Gardner. Gardner, I want to uh, thank you for this interview and wish all the best uh, in the coming year and to receive more positive information. And I hope we will have all chances to to see more positive uh, things around us. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you.